Yeah, so I'm uh, Norm Toby Walsh, and this is Debbie. We uh, work together at Saxonica on, uh, well, Saxonica is small enough, we work on everything, but uh, we have we have collaborated uh, a lot in the past year on Saxon.js, and uh, we're going to uh, talk about that with you today. So anything you want to add? No, it's going to be great. Norm's going to be great. <laughs> okay, so uh, let us let us begin with uh, the obligatory, no, I've got to get the cursor in the right place. Begin with the obligatory what is Saxon.js slide. And all I really want to say on this slide is that Saxon.js is an XSLT3 and XPath implementation in JavaScript. So um, it runs in the browser, it runs on Node.js. It's completely ordinary JavaScript. It just works wherever JavaScript works. So that's the highlight I want you to take away from this. So if you're interested in using XSLT3 in an environment where JavaScript runs, you're good to go. Uh, I hope that everybody has, uh, who is interested in trying to follow along, uh, got the message about the, uh, the repo, which has been up for a couple of days now. I, I put everything in it yesterday, but it's been testable for uh, a few days, and that you've all managed to download that and get it working. Um, we're going to leave all of these materials online, so you can do this at your own pace afterwards if something goes wrong today. Uh, we'll try and help you out in the chat, but um, we've only got two hours and way more than two hours of material, even after we cut out all the stuff we knew we couldn't cover. So um, if you are planning to follow along at this point, you should fire up a shell window and or a command window or whatever they call them on, on Windows and uh, start up one of the servers. Uh, you can start the Python server or the node server, or if you're ambitious, the Docker containerized version of the node server. And when you do that, you should get something that looks like this. I've already started mine because the presentation is in there. Uh, and if you then go to uh, localhost 9000 uh, slash hello, you should get a little hello world. And if you click on that, it should do something. Congratulations, you have used uh, Saxon.js in your own project. Um, Somebody give me a thumbs up to say they got at least that far, please. All right, good. We have somebody who succeeded. Uh, great. Um, the next thing I want to say is that it is going to be necessary for you to look at about five different things if you're, if you're playing along at home. You're going to want a text editor where you can make changes to things, either uh, Oxygen or Emacs in my case, or whatever you want. You're going to want to be able to see the output of the server that's running because this is programming and you're going to make mistakes. And when you do, that's where the errors are going to turn up. Um, you're going to want to be able to see the browser where the results are so that you can see if the things you did worked. And uh, you're probably going to want to be able to have the exercises open in a tab as well, because uh, that is the easy way to cut and paste uh, snippets. We've tried to model the exercises in the tutorial on uh, Stephen Pemberton's excellent model from last year, where he had sort of short, easy to do exercises and kind of led you along. So uh, that's what we've tried to do. Lots of the actual coding is cut and paste off of the exercises. And finally, uh, you're going to want to be able to see us, or if not us, uh, the screen and the slides. If you would prefer to uh, be able to follow along uh, on the slides at your own pace and go backwards and forwards and, uh, and such, they're published online. They're linked from the GitHub repo. Uh, you can just go there yourself if you prefer. Uh, and with that, I believe, uh, no, that's not the switchover point, still me. Um, so, uh, we're going to do most of our examples in the browser. Was there's some discussion of Node at the end, um, but uh, when I asked what people were interested in, most people said they were interested in the browser, and frankly, the browser demo is better than Node.js in a lot of ways. So what does it mean to use Saxon.js in the browser? Well, you need to have four things. You need to have an HTML page to load the browser. The browser has to have somewhere to start. You need to have the Saxon.js runtime library. That's the pure JavaScript implementation of XSLT where all the XML gets uh, manipulated. You need your style sheet in a compiled form, which we'll come back to later. And you need a single line-ish, give or take, of a JavaScript glue uh, to get the whole thing going. Um, as we said in the, in the 
readme file for the repository. You don't need to know JavaScript uh, to follow along. You don't, certainly don't need to know JavaScript to use uh, XSLT in the browser with Saxon JS, but there are some places where you have to stitch some things together. So the anatomy of that hello world example that you just looked at is these four things. There's the index.html page, which I can show you. Oops, that's, not the, that's not the index.html page, but there's the index.html page, which is what the browser loads when you go to the hello uh, site. There is the Saxon JS runtime library that will do the work for us. There's the compiled style sheet, which in fact is, uh, I'm not gonna show you the compiled one. It's this tiny little style sheet that just does something when you click that button. And finally, there's a tiny little bit of JavaScript glue, which I have put in a separate file uh, because I tend to put things in separate files. And that's everything that's on that page. That's how it works. Modulo a bit of CSS to make it look pretty. Uh, we're going to cover all those things in more detail. I just wanted to give you a sort of whirlwind tour. Uh, and, uh, the, the interface between the browser and the actual guts of Saxon JS, the, the, the actual code that runs in response to things, is an object that in the browser is called Saxon JS. And uh, you don't need to understand objects or browsers. Uh, as, you don't need to understand yeah, objects or uh, JavaScript, but just know that you get this thing called Saxon JS and you can make it do things on your behalf by uh, putting dot method name after it. That is dot name followed by parentheses. The next exercise you're gonna use get processor info because that's nice and easy. Um, throughout the day, we're gonna use a lot of the transform method, which is the one that runs transformations for you. Uh, and uh, if you want to know more about it, the website, our documentation on our website is complete and uh, has all the gory details. We've also provided a quick reference. Uh, if you're following along at home, you can click on that link and, uh, and see the quick reference. I recommend you do that right at the moment, but if you come back to this later and want a quick ref, there it is. And now we're switching over. Now we're switching over. Uh, a short game of musical chairs and <laughs> we're actually going to dive into the exercises so hopefully everyone can still hear me too um, I'll try and remember to speak clearly um, so our first uh, yeah so all our exercises are in the exercises directory and in the repo that you hopefully all got and um, you're going to be opening the different exercises or running them in the browser. So we've got a link. So for instance, exercises EX01, we'll open that the index page for that one. Um, uh, so yes, within the exercises directory, we've got the index HTML files and XSLT files. And those are the ones that you're going to be editing yourselves. So that's where to do all your work. Um, and remember to have the um, readmes open somewhere else that gives you the instructions to follow for what the exercises actually do. Um, we've supplied an answers directory as well with some solutions in them. These aren't the only way of doing these exercises. They're a way that does the thing, provides a solution. Um, but yes, it's not necessarily the best, but um, they're there. Um, with the idea of the exercises, we're going to, they're going to be progressively building as we go along. So if you didn't manage to complete one of them, but we're moving on to the next one, then sure, go and look at the um, existing answers that we've provided and work from those instead. Or yes, continue to work from what you've got if you manage to complete them and you're happy with what the code that you wrote. Okay, so exercise one, um, let's look at what the instructions are for this. So firstly, we're just gonna get um, familiar, hopefully get familiar with these different parts that Norm in, introduced, and I guess the switching between your different windows and where you're going to be writing code or what you're looking at and loading. So first off, you want to open the index.html file for exercise one um, in your editor, um, then add 
um, the script that loads XMJS, add another script um, that runs the get processor info function. So these are both going in the index HTML. Um, and then when you open it in your browser window, because you've got your server running, hopefully um, when you open the console log, we can see some information. Um, so yes, yeah, so these instructions, like we said, are in the exercise readme's as well. Is that the link? And yeah, if you open the index, all it's got is this page is intentionally blank. But the point is, if we now open, oh, I can't see it. Now open the console window as well. An object is has been output there, and you should then be able to see some information about the Saxon JS processor, for instance, that it is version 2.3. So let's hope some of you have succeeded in getting this far or understand what we are trying to achieve. Um, okay, so for that exercise, we didn't actually run any XSLT um, because we only did the get processor info function on Saxon.js. Um, but um, the main point of Saxon.js is to be able to run XSLT in the browser. Um, there's a bit of a problem here. So browsers aren't great at processing XML, um, but Saxon.js is trying to mean that you can do some of these things. Um, so yeah, how are we going to run an XSLT style sheet, which is XML? Um, partly because of that issue, um, Saxon.js actually runs, rather than directly running an XSLT style sheet, it runs a compiled version of that style sheet. Um, which is called an SEF, a style sheet export file. Um, and so there's compilers available to produce these SEFs, and then Saxon.js will process those in the browser more efficiently. Um, so here, let's take a bit of a look then. So here's a, um, an example, simple XSLT style sheet. What it looks like as an SEF file is some. Um, JSON, and we're not expected to be able to read that very well. How about pretty printing? Mm, no, that doesn't help very much. Um, but you should never actually have to read an SEF file yourself. You just want to know that it's there and it should be JSON. Um, we occasionally do have to look at our ears. Um, right, so we're going to want to mainly work, work with Saxon JS transform function. Um, but one thing that we need to deal with is waiting for the browser to load the HTML page before you try running extra stuff in that page. Um, so an, I, a way of doing this is to use this window on load function. So this will wait until the HTML page is loaded before it fires off the um, Saxon.js transform function, which will then do some um, XLT processing. Um, there are other ways of doing this, but this is the one that I think we're mainly using in these examples. Um, so just add more than I no, I think that's all right. Okay. So next exercise, exercise two, is we're actually going to run a transformation. Um, so we're run, going to run a compiled, a pre-compiled style sheet. So in the next one, we're going to run, uh, or later we're going to do the actually compiling them. To start with, you've got an SEF available. So again, um, in exercises two, open the index file, add the script um, elements again in the head to load Saxon.js, add a slightly different script element, which does the call for a transform. Um, on some pre-compiled SEF and then open again in the browser. And what do you get this time? Uh, 
I guess some of these things we can keep going. You've had a couple of minutes. I hope that you've managed to get some of these things open and are navigating around the different windows. That's probably the main challenge, or one of the main challenges. Okay, so what were we really doing? Why, why did that run a style sheet? Well, because we called the transform function and that's precisely what that's intended to do. And the um, arguments that we supplied, um, we provided a style sheet location with our pre-compiled SEF um, and an ASIC call, but maybe we're gonna gloss over that. We've got to do asynchronous um, processing, so that's, required. Um, the JavaScript engine in the browser um, will run this um, transform function, which fires off into the style sheet. And then how does that work? So we only provided a style sheet. We didn't provide a source document or anything, um, but we're relying on the default um, initial template action. Um, so only supplying a style sheet, the default is to um, call a template named XSL initial template, and that's the one that we've got in, in the XSLT. And that's what we're going to use in pretty much all of the examples. Um, so we should get familiar with that. Yeah, so this, so this example only used um, style sheet location, um, the first op uh, one of the options for the transform function, but there are plenty of others because of course you want to run different sorts of transforms. Um, you might want to provide style sheet parameters or other such things. And again, you can go and look at the references or our documentation for more information about those. Again, in this one, we're pretty much gonna stick to using style sheet location, I think. Um, okay, and I think we're musical chairs again. Thank you. Right, so. Uh... <laughs> So far, we've done all the heavy lifting. It's time for you to do some of the work. Uh, the next thing you want to do is to compile your own SEF files. And on this slide, we're just reviewing how you might do that. There are basically two ways you can do it. If you have a license for Saxon EE, then you can use the Java product to compile a style sheet with an incantation that looks like this. For the purpose of this tutorial, you do have a Saxon EE license. It's in the lib directory, and that will last for a few more days. So you can uh, you can play around with this uh, today and over the weekend at least. I forget exactly when it expires. Uh, if you uh, aren't comfortable using Java, or if you don't have a Saxon EE license, there's a compiler built into the Node.js version of Saxon JS, and you can use that. Uh, it does require installing Node.js, of course, but um, and the difference here, just uh, for, for uh, a little background, is the Java, the Java product compiles uh, the, the, with the SEF file with Java. The uh, Saxon JS, Node.js version actually has an XX compiler, a compiler written in XSLT. Um, so if you were looking at the options there, this slide, we're just gonna summarize what those are. The XSL and export options tell it where to get the XSL file and where to put the, uh, the SEF file. Um, I wanna observe that the browser will be cranky if it tries to load a CEF file and it doesn't think that it's JSON. So simple thing to do is name the files uh, .json or .ceph.json, which is what we do to keep our uh, cells from being confused. Uh, you can name them anything you want, but if you name them something else, you're going to have to configure your web server to serve them up as application JSON files, or the browser is going to be cranky. Target.js tells uh, the compiler what that you're compiling for JavaScript as opposed to something else. Uh, no go says that you don't actually want to run the transform, you just want to compile it. Um, relocate tells it what to do with base URIs. Uh, we'll come back to that maybe later. And finally, the last option is the really important one. Um, it's the complicated one that has ns pound pound HTML5 in it. What that tells Saxon JS is that it should treat any element in no namespace or any element in the HTML5 namespace as if it was an element in the HTML5 namespace. This more closely matches what the browser does with the documents that it loads and um, if you 
If you don't use that option, you have to be very, very meticulously careful with namespaces and things will go terribly wrong if you, if you don't. So I recommend um, you use that uh, declaration whenever you're compiling a Ceph file. Now it is a, it, the hardest part of setting this tutorial up really is that there are a bunch of you and you all have your own machines and you all are on probably at least three different operating systems, if not more. And getting Java running, getting Node running, getting things working on that many different machines is kind of difficult. And so what we've done is we've provided a Gradle build script that tries to encapsulate some of this for you. So instead of typing the complicated Java command lines or node command lines that I described a moment ago, um, you can run gradle w uh, dot slash gradle w forward or backward slash depending on your operating system and then tell it what style sheet to compile. And if you use EEJ, it will use the Java compiler. It will put the SCF file next to the XSL file and you're done. If you um, decided to use node or Docker, then uh, use the slightly different targets instead of EEJ. Um, the upside of this is you don't have to worry about getting the class path configured for Java. You don't have to worry about getting the directories right for Node. Um, it will probably work better for most of you uh, and quicker for most of you. The downside is this is probably not exactly how you'll do it uh, when you're when you're doing it uh, at home in other projects. Although to be perfectly honest, I've sort of settled on using Gradle as my build tool. So this is kind of like what I do in in the real world. Uh, so. We're going to go on to exercise three, which is your first opportunity to compile a Ceph file, a style sheet. So what I want you to write, what I want you to do is open up another shell window. Don't stop the server. That's got to stay running. Open up another shell window and navigate your way down to uh, where the repository is checked out and run uh, this Gradle command if you want to use the uh, Java compiler run this job, this Gradle command if you want to use the node compiler, uh, use docker underscore XSLT3 if you're using the Docker container. Uh, and that should produce an output file. It shouldn't produce any error messages. Uh, assuming that works, then I want you to open up EXSL uh, exercise 03 in that directory and make a couple of changes to it as described in this page and in the readme. And, uh, Load it up in the browser and see if see if A, it works, and B, does what you expect. And I think what we'll do is give you a few minutes to do that. There are some questions. Yes, so uh, if you're looking at the chat window, um, Sid is reporting an XML parsing error in the Ceph file. From this, I deduce that Sid is using Firefox. Um, we discovered this bug just in the last week or so. I forget who reported it. If you're out there, thank you. Um, although we tell, although we don't care in the XSL in, in Saxon JS about the MIME type of the thing that's loaded, um, Saxon JS 2.3 has a bug where Firefox is fooled into thinking it's supposed to be XML. It gets, we got a default wrong. I got a default wrong, it's my bug. Uh, and so it tries to parse the thing as XML, even though it isn't. This is completely harmless. Um, Firefox doesn't actually stop processing when it encounters this error, uh, and we will fix that in the next release. But, um, yeah, so don't worry about that error, but yes. Um, so Eric says that check Python failed. That means you don't have Python 3 installed or uh, it couldn't find Python 3. So um, if you've got Node or Docker, then uh, go with that. Otherwise you'll have to install Python 3 or put it on your, on your uh, path somewhere in order to get that working. Yeah, thanks for typos. Uh, yeah, so uh, thank you for the typos. If you report them in the chat, we'll, we'll sort those out. I've got a bunch of changes I wanna make to the repo that I decided not to do 10 minutes before the talk began, because I'm not crazy. Good, no. And, and one of the things I've changed, uh, I don't know if you're out there, um, the person, somebody reported that they couldn't use port 9000 because it was used by something else. So one of the things I've changed is that you can change the port number, but that seemed like much too aggressive a change to make moments before a talk. 
All right. Um, is anybody still uh, working on the example? Has anybody succeeded in getting the example to work? Uh, Frank's giving us a thumbs up. That's great. Looking for some other regulars. Is anyone else crying because we're going way too fast? Well, we're going way too fast. I can't really help. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 fair. I, uh, I, I you've got you've got to look at six different screens and listen to us at the same time. It's uh, it's a bit of a challenge. All right, we'll give you another moment or two because um, this is the easiest exercise we've got, and uh, it would be nice if everybody got over this hurdle. All right, while the last minute is winding down, I will show you the answers that we got um, in case. Exercise three. I really, I meant to add style to this to make the words bigger. Sorry, I'll try and fix that. Uh, so uh, when you load up exercise three, you should get congratulations, your style sheet ran. That means you successfully compiled the style sheet. And the uh, magic incantation that I asked you to do, which was to put uh, method equals replace content on the result document. Uh, had an effect. The effect that it had is that uh, instead of having congratulations below the uh, intentionally left blank line, it replaced the intentionally left blank line. So um, if you guessed that replace content might have had that effect, then you guessed correctly. Uh, if you didn't guess that, then, um, well, that's still what happened. <laughs> All right, that is, uh, that's, that's my timer going off. So I'm going to press on. Uh, I hope that everybody who was playing along at home succeeded. The next thing uh, uh, we're gonna introduce is uh, this sort of collection of recipes. I was trying to come up with uh, an example that we could use that would be simple enough to be understandable, but complicated enough to have some, some uh, some sort of feel of reality about it. So uh, what we settled on after some discussion was uh, recipes because everybody knows what recipes are and there are a few interesting things you can do with them to make them interactive. Um, the recipes are mostly in HTML because that's what the browser displays and so there's less transformation work to do. Um, there are much, 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 much better recipe vocabularies than this little um, collection of HTML tags, but um, that was sort of intentional. The markup is very minimal, uh, partly because uh, I don't like putting repetitive information or information in XML that can be generated from authoritative sources. So uh, the, the markup is a little more minimal than you might expect. We're going to fix some of that with Saxon.js. And I've explicitly used extension attributes to identify quantities that will be of particular interest to you in future exercises. This is, um, it was pointed out to me in one of the review sessions we did, that this is a slightly odd thing from the perspective of people who are familiar with XSLT in that we're going to take a document and transform parts of that document and the result is going to be that transformed document. In a traditional server side, working on your desktop sort of XSLT environment, you probably think of taking a document, transforming it and getting a completely new result document. That's not quite what we're doing here because that's not a model that works really well in the browser. The other thing I try to do when uh, writing things for the browser is rely on progressive enhancement. Your site should work even if JavaScript is turned off. So uh, that's the other reason why I made them easy to display. Um, so we're gonna start with recipes that look like this. Uh, and uh, there you go. So it's a pretty bare bones recipe. Um, and what you're going to do over the next several exercises is enhance that in various ways so that you'll wind up with something more like this. This is actually, uh, this, is actually this is actually the answer to exercise 13. So um, we're not going to get all the way to the end of exercise 13 in the two hours that we have, but um, you'll be able to change the uh, number of quantities and update the recipe and you'll be able to switch from uh, the imperial units that I used because I came from America to actual rational units that ordinary, you know, sensible human beings would use. Uh, so that is that is the plan. We're going to start with these very simple recipes, and we're going to wind up with something much more interesting. Uh, I hope. 
Now, uh, one of the things that I've, we've added is uh, some automation because inevitably when you're doing this kind of work, you'll wind up in a edit, compile, test cycle where you want to sort of uh, look at the results. And if you're doing that all by hand on the command line, it means edit the XSL file, find the command line window, run the compile step, find the browser window, open it up, did it work, no repeat, except you'll forget to compile it sometimes, and then you'll spend 10 minutes wondering why your changes aren't making any difference. So uh, I, we've, we've, we've sorted that out for you uh, for these simple examples by uh, a little bit of automation magic. If you load up a file, um, for example, one of the recipes, and you put question mark exercise equals EX303 at the end, the server that's serving it up, our little server, will automatically compile EX03 for you and insert the script lines at the top so that you don't have to. Uh, and if you supply answer equals EX03, you'll get the answer rather than your exercise. So you can flip back and forth between them fairly easily. Um, so the automation that's performed is the script elements automatically get added. The timestamp of the SCF file will be compared against the timestamp of the XSL file, and it will be recompiled if it needs to be. Um, every time it needs to recompile, you're going to get this sort of awkward pause. Uh, you may have noticed that we had that awkward pause when we did a couple of exercises earlier because uh, we're relying on that feature, and I had deleted all the SCF files. Um, and you're going to want to make sure that you can see the server, the window where the server is, because this is where errors are going to happen. If you, if you make a mistake and the style sheet won't compile, the errors are going to be on this window. So you're going to want to be able to see that window. Um, and so all I want you to do in exercise four is uh, point your browser at your favorite recipe. Uh, there's a little, you can, you can point to the recipes directory and see what all the recipes are if you want. Uh, and then add exercise EX04 on the end of it and you should see a transformed result. And if you look at the browser window, if I call, I'll just, well, no, I'll let you guys do it. If you look at the, uh, at the shell window, you should see some indication that, um, that things were compiled. So that is exercise four, hopefully straightforward. All right, that's about three minutes. I hope everybody managed to make it work. Let's uh, let's take a look and see what was supposed to happen in case uh, in case you got stuck or uh, weren't following along. So if I bring up an editor and I edit exercises, actually that's not what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to go to recipes and add exercise equals EXO four the end of that <clears throat> and after a short pause because it's compiling oh. 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 actually it says oh four works even if you haven't done that so it works <laughs> so so uh if we now go and look at the server uh we see here we go so uh we see that when i attempted to load that it used saxon ee to reload that page and if i now Edit ex04, ex04.xl, and change something. And save that file. Look, ma, no hands if I press reload. Uh, again, there'll be this pause while it goes off and does the compiling. And it worked again. So that's what you, that's what you should have seen when you were doing the example. You're going to use this technique for all of the examples in the second hour because it saves so much time. Um, so as I said before, uh, recipe, recipe markup can be done well, or it can be done the way we did, which um, is kind of half-baked, if you'll pardon the pun. Um, the link there, by the way, is to the talk that uh, Peter Flynn gave on recipe markup. Uh, he's done a couple of talks at Balisage on recipe markup, and it's really very nice. I've been, I've been using that for some of my recipes. The important part for our purposes uh, is that the recipes are not too complicated. Um, there are a few things in each recipe. There's a title and a, a category and a number of servings and some ingredients and some directions, which can also contain uh, some measurements. So uh, what I want you to do for exercise five is uh, 
using your, your editing tool of choice, navigate your way into the recipes directory and open up a recipe or two and look at the markup. Think about how the various features are represented in that markup. You're gonna be using, uh, you're gonna be writing XSLT to transform these things uh, uh, when we come back from lunch. And so you'll be, uh, you'll be in good shape if you have a sense for what that looks like. So I'll give you a moment or two to do that. And then I'll uh, show you, I'll navigate my way around the features for you and uh, we'll see where we get to. All right, so uh, I hope everybody was able to, uh, to look at a recipe. I don't think this is uh, the most complicated. There are seven cases of an element with quantity, but not units. That's true. Um, uh, those I think are for things like apples and eggs, which don't really have an obvious unit. Um, so uh, I hope everybody, uh, this, for this group is probably kind of a silly exercise, but I hope everybody can see that uh, we have uh, the number of servings identified with a particular span and an ID for the various uh, quantities. Although the quantity is, is here, uh, the quantities and the units are over here. Um, we've also separately identified the ingredients. So uh, you can imagine, for example, that if you were changing the number of servings, you could do some math on the quantity and then you could reproduce this directly by outputting the new quantity and repeating what's in the span. So um, that's, <laughs> that's, uh, that's funny, Michael. Um, the directions uh, similarly are mostly just HTML, but they do occasionally have some things embedded in them. And if I go back to, uh, if I go back to the what we're aiming for, I don't really, oh, just open it. Okay. yeah, I just open it up again. I could have done that. So um, you can see that um, given the way the recipes are organized, if somebody attempts to change the quantity, what you have to do is a little bit of math on the uh, units, but nothing to the uh, to the ingredients. Um, whether you want to be fancy and get the thirds and things in or not is a different question. Um, and if you change the units, then you also have to, the, the quantities uh, may or may not change, but the units will change. And for exercise 13, actually I'll go to exercise 12. Exercise 13 has the added feature that um, it turns measurements for things like um, butter and flour into grams rather than um, a quant rather than rather than a volume measure. Um, that's a, that's yet another bit of complexity. In exercise twelve, all we do is change them to uh, is change them to uh, metric. So you still wind up with seventy one milliliters of flour, which is a completely absurd way to measure flour. Uh, but you know the Americans do it that way. Um, so that's, that's where we're headed and we're gonna do some exercises along those lines um, before we're done. Uh, where was I? I was... There, right. So we've actually uh, never given this tutorial before and we're eight minutes ahead of schedule, which probably means that uh, per usual, I have been talking much too quickly. Um, anybody have any, uh, Questions they'd like to ask, or uh, can we open the floor up to, to discussion for eight minutes, or would you all like to just go to lunch early and uh, come back in an hour? We can't hear you because you're muted. I, I think this question is fine. Okay. Can I look at the life cycle of the object? You mean the Saxon JS object? Um, the Saxon JS object gets created when the runtime is loaded, and in the browser, I believe, lasts until you navigate off of that page. Um, in Node.js, it gets created when you do the require statement to load the runtime, and um, if you do that in different modules, then you'll wind up with uh, objects that last different lengths of time. But, uh, 
How did I manage the fraction characters? Uh, so if uh, if you look, there's, uh, there's, I actually, um, if you look in the lib directory, uh, there is a little fragment. I wrote that bit for you. So if I load up the answer for um, exercise 13, um, it loads it loads a little utility library that will convert uh, numbers into fractions. Um, so yeah, I just I couldn't resist looking at 0.3333 milliliters or or cups or whatever was just driving me nuts. Yeah, that's why that's in the uh, that's two things about exercise thirteen that um, that are more advanced. One is doing that kind of thing, and the other is loading up the JSON document that describes the conversion between grams and milliliters, or et cetera. And we'll look at that uh, next hour. Not U plus twenty one fifty three. I don't actually know the Unicode codes off the top of my head. Uh, that well, I'm afraid. Uh, just to, sorry to disappoint you, Pete Sid. Um, that's Unicode uh, 215 Baker. I don't know, 53 probably is like one third, then yes, that probably is the character I'm using. Yes, 2153. It's time to actually get into doing some exciting things with Saxon.js. So we purposefully wrote this um, tutorial um, wanting to spend time on the early stuff, the setup, getting things in place and giving people a chance to actually run some of those things and get past those hurdles. Um, to get started with Saxon.js. Like most Saxon.js talks, we maybe go straight into, hey, you want to write some interactive XLT. This is how you can do it. But we didn't explain so much how to get running, what things you need to download, where to put them. Um, but hopefully now that you've tried it or you've seen it done in various ways, you'll be more confident in doing it yourselves and actually playing around with it a bit more. So that was an intentional thing, and yes, um, hopefully we've seen that. Um, so now, in the second half, we actually are going to get into much more of the real XSLT coding and things. So um, the way that we've written the slides now, um, as we already had earlier this morning, I guess, is um, we're just going to um, feed you some of the information as we go along for the next exercises coming up. So there are a number of um, interactive XSLT extensions that are available with Saxon.js, functions and um, extension elements. Um, and we're just going to introduce a few as we go along for the exercises. So the first one that we'll look at is our XSL page. Um, so the browser's DOM is not an instance of the XDM but we want to use XPath and XSLT to manipulate this DOM and um, find our way around and add parts to it. So Saxon.js behind the scenes um, treats it as that. And the way that from within your XSLT, you can get at that object, that the page DOM is with the XSL page function. Um, so you just call that and it returns the yeah, the whole page document link, right? Okay. Um, thank you. Um, we've already seen um, XSL result document used a few times in exercises. Um, um, but now let's actually explain how this is really working. So result document instruction means that you can create secondary results um, and Saxon.js uses these um, to um, create fragments of XML or HTML and then put that result somewhere within your um, window page. And the feature it's using is the um, IDs on elements in the page. So the href attribute of result document, if you begin the name with a 
hash symbol, for example, for example hash main, then Saxon.js is going to look for the element in the page with the ID main, and that's then going to be your context item, or that's where the result document is going to go. So we saw that earlier with either append um, content or replace content. Um, yeah, so you should, the default is to append it to the end of the content, but if you just want to replace the whole thing, which is probably more likely, then you'll use XSL replace content. We saw that earlier. Thank you. So in this next exercise, where had we got to previously? Um, we've added in the um, select um, no. element, no? I don't think so. This is the first exercise to change something. Yeah, so won't we? Okay. I've skipped ahead of me. Okay. Yeah, you're, 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 you're <laughs> my brain's right. somewhere, brain somewhere different. Okay. So let's go back. So we, we were looking at the HTML markup, I guess, and seeing that in the source HTML, you haven't got the titles for the recipe itself, although it's in the markup in the head element title element in the head. Um, and so this exercise is to do an almost identity on the HTML source, but add the titles for the recipe itself and the sections for the um, ingredients and directions headings. So remember that you can use Norm's really neat trick of um, extending your URL so that you can do the automated um, SEF generation and reloading and the fact that you don't have to add the script elements in the index page. Um, all that will do, be done in, uh, automatically. So the place that you do want to go and edit is the style sheet. Um, and that's where you want to start adding some result documents and such like. So we've given you some um, code hints because I've, we've just shown you what they are, but you'll need to copy and paste some more things. So if you go and open, yeah, go and open the exercise six um, style sheet and add to that um, a result document to add the title. Oh, no, we don't yet. <laughs> On the main element, um, you want to add, add the title and then add headers for the ingredients and directions as well. Yep. And let's start a time. Yeah, so uh, this one seems like it might take you a little bit longer, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to suggest we give you three minutes and after three minutes we'll ask how things are going and we'll give you another three minutes if you're, if you're having trouble or if it's more work than, uh, than we think it might be. We have a hand up. Is the hand up to ask a question? Yes, I have a question if, if that's possible. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious about the uh, the uh, the way you uh, conceptualize the side effects here. So uh, if you have a simple model that you just execute the XSLT query and then at the end, you apply your side effects to either uh, replace or uh, append, or if you if you do or maybe have plans to have something a bit akin to the scripting extension that uh, that uh, it, it was a working draft. I think it's a working draft. But um, are you planning to do something like that that you can have side effects also in the in the middle somehow? Um, at the moment, we're constructing the secondary result documents and then updating the DOM with those results. There's nothing at the moment that's like the scripting extensions. It's an interesting idea, but um, as you can maybe imagine, the the models are a little complicated. So um, uh, offline, maybe we could uh, we could have a conversation about mm -hmm. what you think would be the value in doing that. Um, but at the moment, it's just uh, replacing the content with your new fragments. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. And it's also simple and understandable uh, that way. Yeah, thank you. You do have to think a little bit more about remembering, oh, I need to apply templates and where am I putting these and what does it then mean it's copying and such like. Um, 
but hopefully you've got those in the right places and then to see what we were we are expecting to see I don't see the right place so if i go to the answer exercise six yes so hopefully our answer has indeed put the pizza heading on and the title of the headings for the ingredients and the directions um so yes if you didn't quite get to the end of that one then we certainly recommend using that um the style sheet answers in exercise six for moving forward Let's see what the next slide says so we're going straight on to exercise seven and this is where we're going to do the select um i guess we saw it at the just before lunch of this is where where we're going this is what we're aiming to achieve we're going to want to have the interaction in the page of you be able to select um how many how many servings you're cooking for so the first part of that is just going to be adding the select option to your page and um reacting to the event of clicking on that um, and then the interaction later will be that it we're going to aim towards recalculating the ingredients in the menu itself in the recipe itself so the first part is so if you go to exercise seven and read me there and follow the instructions but otherwise on this slide as it explains um, you want to replace the servings text with a fall down menu that looks something like that. Um, and add the rest of your results from the previous example in your style sheet. And then the all we want to do at this stage is oh, we're not even we're not even handling an event at all, sorry. Um, it's just add a select element and you want to have annex, uh, the current um, attribute be correct. I didn't explain that right. So you want to display the current number of servings. So you use the select selected attribute on the correct option. And you might want to actually be able to pick that up from the recipe itself using a variable or otherwise yeah i mean this is this is uh, this is a, a this is a, a late addition to this slide because if you if you do the simple thing which is perfectly fine for for the tutorial and you just replace the number of servings with the select dialogue then your recipe will display a select dialogue with one serving but the ingredients on the page the actual numbers that are the default on the page will still be for however many servings it was initially so the extra fun challenge here is to work out a way to get the selected attribute on the right option and that's a um, Do you want to come oh no nobody needs to see my ugly mug uh, so um yeah replace the replace the number of servings with the select drop down that's the easy part if uh, if you get there first before everybody else does then think about how you would arrange for the correct option to be highlighted so the working answer is just that hopefully we will get a select drop down in the page which already says four um and then we can click on that but it does not yet do anything should we also look at the xslt itself or not? um i think you should just go on to the next slide um yeah i think we're going to carry on if you yeah again refer to the answer instead if you need it but yes now we want to actually be able to handle within the ixslt um, interaction in the browser from users so we want to pick up browser events um, so to actually make these recipes a web application 
um, when we respond to user events. Um, how that works in the browser is that, yeah, there are event objects for clicks or changing things or scrolling in a page. And any of those actions fire an event in the browser. Um, and then the event has details about what the interaction was, um, what kind of event, and then the browser itself looks for event handlers, so code that handles the type of event that it was. So it starts by looking on the event where the event occurred, so a click, for instance, um, on a button, and then the parent element and the grandparent and so on, and that's called bubbling up. So wherever it finds an event handler in any of those um, elements, it will run the code for that. So how are we going to how are we going to allow you to create event handlers? Is with um, an event handling template in your XSLT. So suppose, for instance, like in this example, um, you want to respond when someone changed a select pull down. So we're looking for the change event on an HTML element, in particular a select element. So we're going to write a template which matches or yeah uh, acts on a change. So we use an IXSL on change mode, um, and that then means we're creating an on change event handling template. And the match element for your template, the match attribute tells you what which element this event handler is going to be located on. Um, and of course, you can use whichever event name the mode to use is IXSL on event name. Okay. Um, and then once an event has um, happened then how can you, from within your IXSLT, find out information about that event? We've got an extension function IXSL event that will then get the event object. So the event object is a JavaScript browser object, not an XTM item. Um, so we also want to know, well, how can we interrogate that sort of item and so there's another extension, IXSL get, um, which means that you can look at the properties on um, JavaScript objects. So for instance, in this play, in this case, um, we're likely, or one thing we might want to do is look at the target property or the value and the value property of the target of the event object itself. And here is how you will do that. You use IXL cell get on the event object um, and look up the properties in this form. So there's kind of a mix of JavaScript syntax in there, um, but hopefully you can see past that and see what that's doing. I guess one one thing that that um, you you do just have to know is what the properties of the event are. So you, there's a, the references include some links to online resources you can use to look things up. So you, you can't magically know that the event for a change includes a target property and that target property includes a value property that will tell you the value of the option that was changed in the select. You aren't supposed to be able to know that just out of thin air. You have to look that up. We're giving you the line at the end, which is the answer for this exercise. But if you want to do something with a button change or do something with a scroll action, you will have to look up what properties you want to find. They're, they're almost always there um, and uh, you know, a, a web search away. And exactly someone's raised in the chat that you could create your own event handler in JavaScript. And yes, you could do that. But this is a way for us to write it in XSLT itself. Okay, so let's go to exercise eight and work on what we previously had. Now you want to be able to handle a change event on a select element. So we're going to stick in exactly one of the, these event handling templates. 
Um, but now all we're asking is to demonstrate that you've captured the event. Just I do one of the things that hopefully you you know how to do it already. So if you use an XSL message, then that will write to the console, and we saw that earlier. And you can look at that, or use some result document to put some information in the page. And then in later exercises, we're actually going to do change more things on the recipe. But for now, just do something simple to make sure that you are catching the event. It's been suggested on the previous slide there was an extra parentheses in that example. Can we just go back and peek? I'm just curious. Open, oh, yeah, open, close. Yes, okay. I put an extra print in there. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. John did. Mm -hmm. John we missed did one of those. I think yeah. something in a week. If you uh, if you had trouble finishing the previous exercise, feel free to copy the answer from the previous exercise and and start there if uh, if that's simpler for you. So now when we click on the select, hopefully it tells us something in the console. <gasps> I changed something. That's good news. Let's do it again. It happened again. Good news. Um, but yes, you might have done something subtly more interesting in the page. But there we go. Next exercise is again more involved. Oh, there's more XSLT and XPath involved in this one, I think. A bit more thinking. Um, we're getting to the real meat and potatoes if we're going to abuse <laughs> the recipe metaphor to no end. Oh, he's funny. Um, so yes, we're actually going to start updating the thing, quantities in the recipe with this change the number of servings. So Norm has very nicely put together some suggestions of how you would want to do this. Um, you will probably need to compute a scaling factor. So know what you what number of servings you previously were showing and what has it changed to and work out the right scaling factor. And then reformat the ingredients in the section. So multiply by the scaling factor. So we've got the different the X attributes. Yes, to X work with quantity. there. And then X quantities, there we go. Um, and you'll want to use the result document to update that um, ingredients list um, and the whole list at this stage, right? Yeah. Um, update that whole ingredients section with the new numbers in. Um, and hopefully the one bit of code that you need to remember again is using this Excel get an XSL event. Which once again has two, an extra closing parenthesis because I cut and pasted it. It could have been me. Yeah, it could have been you. So time's on. Time, the timer's on, get to work. If anybody has any questions or uh, stumbles at all, uh, let us know. We do. Me yes, too. you. So Peter observes. Peter observes in the chat that uh, after you update the select, you need to be able to get the new value in order to determine what the scaling factor is. So you might have to go back and think about a way of of squirreling the original value away in a corner someplace where you can get out again. I believe I, uh, in my solution, I shoved it in an extra x hyphen attribute on the select element, but uh, that's not the only way to do it. But this get should get the new value. Yes. So it's still remembering what the old value is that you also need to have done. We now have a select box that I can click on and it does indeed change the quantities in the ingredients. Sorry if I've gone quiet. Um, so what is next? we have a secondary part of the same exercise. So in that one, we suggested updating the whole of the ingredients section in the page. But of course, you 
didn't really want to change all of the information. Um, we only wanted to update the quantities, not all the rest of the title and the prose necessarily. So a way that you can do that is to use this little trick of using the question mark dot as your href for a results document instructs to um, output that the result at the current context item. So in this example, we're looking at a list item and then we're just going to update the content of that list item. Um, so for the previous exercise, if you'd already known this, then you might have written it a slightly different way. And that's what 9B solution does. So the exercise here is to change your answer for nine, and perhaps you could rewrite it slightly to use this um, action to only update the con at the context in the page rather than the rest of the section. Right. So if, uh, my suggestion is if you finished the previous exercise, go ahead and make this change. I'm going to give you another three minutes. Um, if you if you didn't get to the end of the previous exercise, uh, put this information in your back pocket, continue working on it as before, and uh, you can come back to this in the future if you need to. Yeah, we can use the chairs. I think, I think this is where the yeah, chairs, chairs occurs. Yeah, this is where the Yes, if there is a reason it looks like a lookup operator, mm -hmm. and I, um, it's yes, there is a reason. I forget what the reason is. Why does it look so much like the question mark dot looks? It looks like a map map lookup operator because it is a map lookup operator mm -hmm. in some sense, and I have forgotten precisely what sense. And look up on the context item. Yeah, yeah. I think that's, that's, that's that makes sense. Um, no, you can't. You can't use it for navigation because it's just saying where the output of results document should go. Once you're in this context, if you're in a template that for if you're in this template, for example, and you want to know what an ancestor is, you can just use XPath to get to the ancestor. That's you, the context is already what it is. Um, that's just for the result document. Um, John said there was more than C. Yeah, it's it basically we have. In the past, there has been the question mark introduced effectively in XPath, which meant you could you could basically generally navigate down below the point where you wanted to make the uh, make the effects. And we only just we put in the only implemented the uh, dot mm -hmm. effectively dot uh, as the mechanism for there. But there was, and I may have been in CE, but there certainly was an earlier version which was much more generic, and we might end up. We might end up putting that back in at some stage. Yeah, it was, it was only CE. It's a, we've only got this. In yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's where it came from. Yeah. Um, Alan, the uh, you can see the results if you look at the uh, inspection window. If you do view source, the browser goes off and gets the original source. That's why view source isn't working. But for example, if I go to the um, I realize I'm distracting people while they're trying to work, but if I go here and change the number of quantity, change the number of quantities, and then inspect that, okay. that will show the four and a half from the. But if I did view source, I'd get the original source, which wouldn't be as useful. All right. Okay. Thank you. Um, at this point, uh, what we want to introduce is IXSL schedule action. And the reason we want to introduce that is because of the way the browser works. The browser is single threaded, which means it will only do one thing at a time. And you, the code in control of the thread, gets to keep the control of the thread until you voluntarily give it up. Uh, in lots of operating environments, uh, the scheduler is preemptive and will take control away from you. In JavaScript, it's not. 
Uh, and so it will just let you keep running and keep running and keep running. But if you do that, the browser will eventually get uh, cranky with you. So um, in exercise 10, while you're listening to me and while I go on to the next slides, open up a browser window and, uh, well, actually, I'm gonna give you a minute to look at exercise 10. I want you to look at the XSLT and see if you think you know what it does and then start it running in a browser and observe the behavior of the browser. And then I'll, um, I'll move on from there. The point of this is that if you attempt to do too many things without giving the browser a chance to do something else, the browser will eventually put up a nasty dialog box saying, are you sure you want to let this user continue monopol monopolizing your computer? Uh, and so, uh, in fact, once you've looked at the code in exercise 10, you may work out that that's the sort of thing that would happen. If you're using your browser to watch, if, you, if you've got the, the session, the video embedded in the browser, don't run this exercise. <laughs> your browser is going to be unhappy with you for about 90 seconds. Yeah, I should, should have said that earlier, shouldn't I? Um, Right, hopefully everybody's had a chance to look at that code. Um, the way that you avoid this when you're doing uh, stuff in uh, Saxon JS is through schedule action. And there are sort of three different things you can do with schedule action. You can uh, wait a certain amount of time. So you wouldn't want to busy wait. If you want to, if you want to do an animation, if you're uh, putting up a clock and you want to advance the minute hand every minute, you absolutely don't want to delay for a minute without giving control back to the browser because that will just not work. Um, the other thing you can do is load documents. You can today usually load documents in a completely synchronous fashion but you will get a nasty warning message in the browser console window saying this is um, deprecated and eventually that's probably going to not work. So don't do that. Uh, IXSL schedule action is how you tell uh, Saxon JS, go off and get a document and do, let me do something with it when you're done. The third thing you can do is uh, the EX path HTTP request, which is more complicated than we're gonna try and cover today, but um, you can do sort of complete XPath HTTP request magic with schedule action and then respond to those events. So uh, on this slide, we see a couple of examples. Here is the wait example. So if I was, uh, if I was doing a clock in Saxon JS, I might say schedule action, uh, wait a second and then update the clock to move the second hand, wait a second. And the, the only thing you can put in schedule action is call template. So basically you tell Saxon JS, go off and do this thing for me, get this document, wait this number of seconds, perform this complicated HTTP request. When you get some answers back, then call me at this template and I will respond to that. That template can in turn schedule an action even on itself again. So in the clock example, I can say, wait a second, update me, update the second hand, wait a second, update me, update the second hand. You can, so you can, you can loop like that. Um, one wrinkle is that the behind the scenes, the way this works is the document you've requested in the second case doesn't get delivered directly to you. It gets put into the pool of documents that Saxon JS knows about so that when you do a doc or unparsed or JSON doc request on it, it will be immediately available in the cache and the browser won't, uh, won't be cranky with you for, for trying to do a synchronous request. Um, exercise 11, 12, and 13 belong here. And I want you to, uh, to try and do those exercises offline. Um, we think they're the valuable next steps for learning how to, to do some of these things. Please uh, you know, try them out on your own and uh, report back, uh, ask questions in the Slack chat or send us email if you, if you have trouble uh, completing them. In the interest of time, I'm not gonna try and uh, make you do them on the clock at the moment. I will show you the answer to this one because it's fun to see uh, schedule action in, uh, in action. That's not where I wanted to start. I wanted to start with the HTML file. And I want to start with the answer. This is exercise 11. So 11A. The exercise 11A is this one, which is compiling in the background and making me nervous. Uh, and it 
uses the JSON file that we described right here to work out what the possible categories are. And exercise 11B, when you're comfortable with doing that, will ask you to, um, to also then respond to clicks on those categories and show the events. So you can, uh, you can choose between them. And you can do all of this in Saxon.js with the techniques that we've taught you today without a single line of JavaScript. And if you're uh, adventurous, you can probably do a better job of providing the titles I didn't bother. Uh, we were trying to keep the exercises as small as we could. So that's exercise 11. Exercise 12, another ambitious exercise uh, for you to try is converting between the units. Uh, so if somebody says they want to have metric instead of uh, imperial units, just like you did the example before the exercise to change the quantities, you can use the same techniques to change the units as well. And uh, the ones that don't have units don't need to have their units changed. Two eggs is two eggs, whether it's metric or imperial. Uh, and then if that's still, uh, if you're still having fun and still enjoying yourself, um, uh, the US style of measuring uh, ingredients like flour in volumes is amusing to my friends on the continent. And so uh, exercise 13 uh, provides a document which will allow you to map between uh, volumes and uh, weights. So two, three tablespoons of butter will become 43 grams of butter. I take no responsibility for the accuracy of the conversions. And if you're, you know, um, don't, don't, uh, don't blame me if that turns out to be a little too much or a little too little butter. But. Uh, so that is, that is our summary of Saxon.js in the browser. In the last few minutes, um, I want to do a, uh, <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Sorry if you if you're not looking at the if you're not looking at the chat. Uh, Michael's response to my comment was amusing. Uh, I want to do a few minutes of Saxon JS in Node JS because I actually think it's really cool. I've moved all of the stuff that I do server side that I used other tools for um, to Node JS and Saxon JS, uh, and it's, I'm really pleased with how it's worked out. So what is Node? For those of you who haven't heard of it, it's a it's basically JavaScript on the server. Um, some folks who were doing a lot of JavaScript work in the browser said, we've got all this code that does all this cool stuff that runs in the browser. We want to run it on the server as well. Why can't we do that? And so uh, they got together and put um, constructed a server backend that runs JavaScript. Um, there are a lot of applications that run on Node. There's a really large ecosystem of tools that make writing applications to run on Node easy. Um, I was amazed how quickly I could hook up databases and web servers and things, just download the right packages and it kind of works. But Node is in JavaScript. And as we've already observed, JavaScript doesn't have great support for XML. And so that's what Saxon.js is for. Um, Saxon.js runs in Node as a, as a hunk of JavaScript and provides XPath3 and XSLT3 on Node.js and performs very nicely. Um, there are two packages. There's the actual Saxon.js implementation, which uh, is what you would use in your application on Node.js to run the transform function and such. Um, it all, there's also an XSLT3 command line tool. Uh, and that's what you use for compiling Ceph files, for example, or just running transformations from the command line if you want to use Node as your platform. Um, so um, those are the two packages. If you know how, how Node works, then this slide will be completely self-explanatory. And if you don't know how Node works, at least observe that it doesn't take very much in terms of lines of code to use uh, these two tools in your Node package. Uh, this is how you tell Node that, you're, that you want to use packages. Um, so I wanted to do an exercise uh, with you, but I thought trying to teach you all how to use Node might be a little bit um, evil at this uh, juncture, having forced you through two hours of exercises. So instead, I'm going to show you a Node.js um, package written that uses Saxon.js. Uh, and what we're going to do with uh, Node is we are going to compute the number of days until Christmas. Because I find doing date arithmetic in XPath 
easy and straightforward and makes sense to me. And I find doing date arithmetic in Python and Node and JavaScript and other things always sort of slightly confusing because days are one based, but months are zero based, and years are what, 1900 based or something? Eh, never mind all that. So instead, what I've done is I've written a little uh, tiny uh, Node.js uh, tool that uh, imports Saxon.js, works out the date in terms of year, month, day, the ISO 8601 date for Christmas, and then runs this XPath expression. Um, it uses XPath Evaluate, which is a, a Saxon.js uh, API that we haven't actually previously used, but here's an example why you, where you might want to. And it will tell you the number of days until Christmas. So does anybody know the number of days until Christmas? Uh, I'm going to tell you. Uh, I'll be a little disappointed if it's what's on the screen when I switch the tabs, but uh, if I say node, node Christmas, our Saxon.js thing will run and it's 51 days until Christmas. So um, the other thing you can do uh, is transform documents. I think I've already said this using the xslt3.js, which we saw earlier. Uh, and thank you. 1400 uh, mm -hmm. local time on the dot. Uh, we have reached the end of our slides. There are lots of references in uh, the slides that follow. Thank you all very much. <laughs>